Good morning, everybody. Uh, it's 11 o'clock. It's Sunday, the 26th of April, and you are live with Kevin Williams of Survival Skills Rider Training, and you're watching uh, my live webcast, 11s, is where I bring you some topical news, controversial views, and some better biking tips from time to time. Um, okay, so uh, what have we got to talk about today? Um, well, before we go any further, I just want to uh, run a couple of things past you. First of all, a, a big apology for everybody who tuned in, and there were a lot of people online, more than I've had for any uh, previous broadcast by a long way, um, who looked in to see Science of Being Seen. Um, unfortunately, due to technical difficulties in the studio, 
um i didn't actually get past the first five minutes i've no idea why um i tested it 20 minutes or so earlier and i had uh, run the uh, presentation a couple of weeks earlier from end to end without any problem whatsoever and yesterday it just didn't want to play ball uh, bizarrely two hours later everything was working fine again so i have absolutely no idea what the problem was um, my guess is it was probably at the Facebook end of things. Um, but hey-ho, these things happen. Um, okay, so next announcement piece of news I have is that uh, tomorrow I will have another very special guest on my series on CE-approved motorcycle clothing. Um, do pass this on to people because we all need protective clothing but most importantly we actually need protective clothing that works and we need to understand what it can offer us and how it works and what the standards mean uh, we have the new a double a triple a rating system how does that actually hold up in real world tests well tomorrow you'll be able to find out because i am interviewing dr chris Horan, who's a material scientist at deakin university in australia and he has been instrumental in producing a set of tests uh, which actually um, replicate the kind of wear that you get out on the road if you're sliding down it. And what he uh, what this uh, what he's done is produced a standard called Moto Cap, which allows you to see in an easy way, a five star rating system basically how those garments hold up from abrasion, uh, but also the heat test waterproofing and breathability. Um, that may not seem particularly uh, pertinent over here in the UK, but we do get warm days, but it's particularly important down under where it does get quite hot. So tune in tomorrow uh, for the CE uh, special with Dr. Chris Horan. Um, it's a unique chance to see one of the experts who really knows what he's talking about actually discussing how motorcycle clothing works and how it's tested and how his tests hold up when compared with the real road because he has built a rig which allows him to test clothing on his own test machine but also actually by literally grinding it away down the road surface so basically you've got to check on uh, what he offers okay last thing i wanted to talk about uh, very briefly is that i am introducing some uh, supporter and subscriber content over on my coffee page um, i'll give you some more heads up on that uh, for probably via a written post later today but right at this moment there are uh, 50 articles gone up over there so anybody who actually supports my work through uh, coffee dot com um that's ko dot fi dot com um will actually get access to these articles and there are more going up all the time i have a back catalogue of facebook posts going back to 2014 and earlier uh roughly 100 a year which i'm going to be putting up um, so you can count that out for yourself, work out what the sums are. That's an awful lot of articles which will be available to uh, supporters. Um, so have a look at that. Uh, the first 50 have already gone up. Just pop over there and you can see them if you're one of my supporters. OK, right on with the uh, the news. Well, what's been going on in the world? Well, unfortunately, the uh, tale of uh, motorcycle crashes uh, continues to make sorry reading. There was a police motorcyclist killed in collision with a car on a pursuit uh, this week. Um, but there are also other crashes still happening. Man was killed in Warrington on Sunday. Uh, on Monday morning, a 27-year-old was killed in Glasgow in a collision. 47-year-old man died in Shenley on the same day in the afternoon in yet another collision. And uh, it's not just motorcyclists being injured, it's also pedestrians too. An 83-year-old woman suffered life-threatening injuries after a crash uh, when she was hit by a motorcycle in Hull on Wednesday morning. So all I can say is, you know, be aware that the roads might be almost empty compared with what you're used to, but doesn't mean they are empty of hazards. The, the sad thing is, the scary thing is that the fatality rate is still running at something very similar to what it would be pre-lockdown. We're getting almost one a day fatal accidents, and that's what normally we see. Right, okay, uh, 
So um, stay with me. I will be talking in just a moment about the motorcycle brand that you've never heard of, Brixton, and how they plan to bring out a, a large capacity bike. Um, I'll be looking at one of my favorite books, um, which is this one here, which I'll just give you a quick glimpse of. Ride Hard, Ride Smart by Pat Hahn. I'll be talking to you about that book. And we'll finish up with an item on bike fitness, uh, how we can stay in shape when we finally get out of lockdown for those of us who are not riding. And we'll be talking about the need for some cardio exercise. All right, okay, Brixton then. Who are they? Um, well, they're probably, as I said, the bike brand that you've never heard of. Uh, I certainly hadn't heard of them. Um, you might be forgiven to thinking that they are something to do with the hipster area of London, um, which is currently very trendy. Um, it was a bit of a no-go area when I lived not far away many years ago, but uh, things change. Um, but you'd be wrong. Um, it turns out that they are a brand owned by the Austrian KSR Group. You've probably never heard of them either. Uh, I hadn't. Um, they're based in a, a town called Krems. Now, um, when I was doing a bit of research on this, I actually found that uh, somebody had um, made a mistake and had said they were based in Krups. Well, Krups is a steel company. Uh, was I think it's still active. Um, but Krems is the town in Austria where they're based. And uh, it seems they're actually quite big, at least if their press statements or anything to go by. What they do, as do many of the motorcycle companies that we've never heard of, is they act as a middleman. Um, whilst they don't actually build the bikes themselves, what they do is they import and badge up small and mid-range capacity bikes. And uh, in that role, what they do at the moment is that they have bikes uh, built by CF Moto, uh, Royal Enfield, Malaguti, uh, Lambretta. Um, and they claim to sell a total of 60,000 products every year, um, which includes their motorcycles, a range of ATVs and quads, and also electric bikes. Now, you'll probably notice that some of those manufacturers are Chinese, CF Moto and Malaguti, for example. Um, now, it appears, having looked at their history, that like most uh, of these importers of Chinese bikes, they started with small CC machines and they have a range of 125s which appear to be based on the old air called Suzuki engine, um, which you'll find uh, powering uh, motorcycles uh, all over the place uh, with Chinese uh, labels on them. Um, nothing particularly wrong with that, uh, except they tend to be a little bit on the slow side compared with the latest Japanese offerings, but uh, they seem to get where they're going. Um, Suzuki had a range of 125s um, which were Chinese built and they were quite um, adequate machines. We used them for training purposes for quite a while. Now they were a little bit um, clumsily engineered, let us say. Things like the bike rack on the back that was built in and the footrest hangers were not exactly lightweight and svelte, but they did the job. The finish wasn't bad and the engine was reliable. Um, they certainly matched the old Honda CGs for reliability. Um, so they've got a range of these 125s, as I said, but the last year um, they started uh, importing a range of bigger machines. Now, these were first announced at the bike shows in 2019, um, and they've appeared uh, on the market uh, right at the end of last year and beginning of this year. Um, and these have a 500cc motor, and they're called the Crossfire 500, and there's an X version of it as well. The bike's powered by a 486 parallel twin, um, making 47 horsepower, so that fits uh, bang in the A2 license category, which means they're friendly for the sort of 21 and up uh, age group. Um, and that's more than double the size of anything that they've offered before. So um, those bikes um, are perhaps not surprising the sort of hipster style and not my cup of tea at all. Um, you know, sort of thing with a sort of pared down back end and what appears to be no real back seat. Uh, there is something there, but it's a bit of a perch rather than what I would call a proper seat. But uh, again, you know, that appears to be a, a desirable style for sort of certain riders. That's not what I like, but uh, anyway, there we go. 
The water cooled motor appears like uh, it could be based on a Kawasaki twin. Uh, certainly, that uh, twin cylinder Kawasaki engine has appeared in a number of machines. And uh, as I say, they went on sale earlier this year. But uh, the really interesting bit is um, at the end of last year, and again, this popped up in my news feed at, some, at one point, um, they showed off a large capacity parallel twin. Um, now, this bike is what might be called classic uh, sort of power cruiser styling and it's clearly aimed head-on at triumph's bonneville t120 which you'll recall is no longer the fairly modest 650 cc of the original t120 but actually a 1200 cc bruiser now uh, although this new machine uh, this brixton 1200 is not still under wraps um, and the capacity hasn't actually been announced by the, the manufacturer there are uh, stories going around in china that it will be a 1200 cc machine so that gives you an idea exactly what the target market is um, it will be built in china um, but the uh, press release that i've seen tells us that the development work for the new model has all been carried out in-house by KSR. Um, okay, again, as an importer of bikes, it's not hard, it's hard to see precisely where their um, expertise comes from, but um, you know, again, presumably they've done their homework um, and hopefully the bike will be uh, sound. Uh, it's due for production uh, as early as 2021, although Brixton won't commit to a date. But what they do say is that it's a declared goal that this bike will make it into serious production. It's not yet been decided when it will be. We want to create a technically mature vehicle without time pressure, which meets more than just the high quality requirements in these cubic capacity classes. Okay, so yeah, if the 1200 triumph is aimed squarely at the sort of harley uh, market uh, then this is aimed even more squarely at the triumph uh, the big question is will it sell well uh, a very good question we've had um, you may recall um, sort of these cruiser style bikes um, from other manufacturers for some time in fact one of the best if um, you like it was the Japanese Bonneville, the W series from Kawasaki. Uh, it started off as a 650 parallel twin, looked like a 1960s Bonneville, and uh, it was quite a nice little bike from all accounts. I never rode one, but I had a friend who did, and uh, he, he loved it. And that model, model ran from 1999 to 2006. Um, it was discontinued briefly, but then came back again as an 800, um, stretched the engine um, to meet the new uh, noise and emission regs. Uh, the engine had to grow, performance didn't really. Um, thing was still, I think, it, I think they're around about 40 odd horsepower, not particularly powerful, but again, as all things considered i'm told it's a very nice machine to ride however uh has it sold um well the answer is not really you see them around but you don't see numbers of them if you're going to see a sort of custom style bike uh, of that nature it's almost certainly going to be a triumph um so quite frankly whether a chinese bonneville will cut the mustard over here uh, with buyers is open to question um will it sell in europe well again you know I, I honestly don't know the answer to that but i do suspect that the heritage of the name sells a lot of bikes for triumph and you know i have my doubts that it will sell in europe uh us uh who knows again um triumph had a huge market over there as did the other british companies in the 50s and 60s but it collapsed uh, the heritage brand over there now is largely dominated by harley davidson and uh, indian um triumphs do sell over there but again you know would people pick up on a triumph replica that's built by a chinese manufacturer and sold through austria i have no idea um one thing that is for certain it would have to be significantly cheaper to uh, attract buyers um it may of course 
be that that's not actually the target market at all. It may be that the bike is actually aimed um, back at the east, and particular India, which is biggest motorcycle manufacturer, um, sorry, biggest motorcycle consumer in the world, and the market over there is growing and it's moving up market. Uh, India was dominated by small CC machines for a very long time. You used to see 125s and 150s. Um, but as other manufacturers have discovered, uh, Ducati, for example, moved in, um, people are now wanting bigger, more powerful machines. So it's possible that it's the Indian market and perhaps the Indonesian market too that this machine is aimed at. I'm sure we'll find out in due course. Okay, just a reminder that you are watching uh, 11s is with Kevin Williams here. Uh, the topical news, uh, controversial views and better biking show. Um, stay tuned. We are going to be looking at uh, one of my favorite books by Pat Hahn in just a moment. And we have an article on fitness to finish the show. So stay tuned for that right to the end. Don't forget if you can't stay to the end you can catch the show uh, on replay here on facebook and you'll also find it on my youtube channel www.youtube.com survival skills uk don't forget that all important uk on the end all right okay now um i have promised to give you glimpses of my riding book library and uh, as i just mentioned this one is one of my favorites let's just try and get that in the camera oh, it's always difficult moving it backwards and forwards ride hard ride smart and the author is a chap called pat hahn there is name that is on the bottom um now pat hahn uh worked for i think it was uh, the minnesota uh road safety uh department um in the us and um I first came across references to his book back on the old CompuServe forum, which I was a member of years and years and years ago. Um, and a lot of American writers uh, on the forum uh, rated his particular book. So we're going back to the mid 90s when I was actually switching from being a courier to becoming a trainer and starting to give some thought to actually setting up my own advanced training school and uh the thing is about pat hahn is he's hardly known this side of the atlantic it was the americans on that forum who told me about him i had never heard of him before so when i started to uh, plan ahead I, I started to acquire some books and this was one of the first that i bought um and the fascinating thing was that what I found was that Pat Hahn's thinking runs parallel to my own, even though we're separated by the width of the Atlantic. Now, here's, here's my thinking. It's easy to fall into a trap that after taking any training, doesn't matter what it is, it could be training in riding motorcycles, it could be training in using a piece of mechanical equipment in a factory, uh, it could be training to use a food processor you could be on a cooking course but one of the things that we tend to assume is that once we've got that training uh, in in our heads as it were that we know what we're doing and in particular when we're doing using potentially dangerous equipment we tend to think that that training's made us safer now that's not actually correct it hasn't um what it has done is it's taught us the technical skills that were taught on the course Unless that training delivers two extra things, then all we have is improved technical skills. It's what we do with the training that really matters, not the training itself. So we have to understand when we're doing training for motorcycling, we have to understand where things go wrong. And that means having a knowledge of accidents and crashes because without understanding where skills break down, those skills remain largely theoretical. They're simply technical ability. They do not come with insight into where we might naturally come a cropper. So we do need that insight into where accidents happen to understand those technical skills. Second thing is we need to understand and appreciate 
the potential consequences for us if things do go wrong. It's no good just assuming that because we're doing X, Y, Z, we're going to be safer because we did a course in it. Um, we actually need a risk analysis strategy. Um, we need to understand what can go wrong, why it can go wrong, how it can go wrong, where it can go wrong, and then apply a way of riding which help hopefully keeps us from making mistakes. Now that risk sort of analysis strategy that I've just uh, described um, it underpinned my survival skills courses right from the start. They're not called survival skills for no reason. Uh, it is not a coincidence. And it continues to understand, uh, underpin my training and it underpins what I write about and what I'm, I talk about uh, online too. So back to Pat Hahn. The interesting thing was that when I got hold of a copy of his book, I was very interested to see that uh, he was using much the same approach. Now, Pat um, explains why it is that we need to assess and manage risk. And Pat shows that uh, we can assess risk on a, a basically on a fairly simple scale. And he uses one to 10, where he says one is safely home in bed and 10 is seconds from certain death. Um, well, OK, uh, if we want to enjoy riding a bike, one is a non-starter. And if we want to continue enjoying riding a bike, 10 is obviously a non-starter too. So we need to stay somewhere in the middle. And Pat goes on to explain how it is and why it is that we need to use our skills and our knowledge to try to keep ourselves sort of between the two extremes. Now, um, when you read the book, you may well be put off by Pat's frank approach about the ways we can end up personally broken from riding a motorcycle. Um, but that'd be a mistake because it's that understanding of where, how, why things go wrong that empowers us. I hate that word, actually. I don't know why I used it. Um, but yeah, that's what it does. It gives us the, it gives us the ability to take some positive steps to manage the risk. Once we know what it is, we can do something about it. Um, as an aside, you may be wondering about the title, Ride Hard, Ride Smart, given what I've just said about Pat's content within that book. Well, the interesting thing is uh, I wrote a review on it quite a few years ago, and uh, I got an email back from Pat himself. And uh, he told me that the uh, working title that he'd come up with was something really catchy. It was something along the lines of uh, low risk riding strategies for the thinking rider. Um, he sent it off to his publisher. His publisher sent it straight back with a sort of sticky note attached to the front of it saying, won't sell with that title. And uh, instead uh, suggested that he use the, the title Ride Hard, uh, Ride Smart. And that's where it came from. Um, so to sum up, the it's an all-in-one better biking book in a kind of DIY fashion like my survival skills book is, although it covers much of the same thinking. Um, it focuses entirely on the concept of hazard uh, reduction. Um, there are some interesting bits in it. There are some bits about riding in ways uh, in extreme conditions, again, in a way to reduce our risk. So it will give you a lot to think about. It's not a book for new bikers, really. Um, because you need some base understanding to actually pull the best from it. So if you've got some biking time behind you, then it's definitely something to think about it. Um, with that in mind, um, it's not so easy to track down. It's one of these books which uh, appears sporadically on this side of the pond and tends to go in and out of stock quite a lot. So you'll have to keep looking for it. Um, it should be probably, uh, I haven't looked at the price recently, um, but I think I paid about uh, 23 or 24 pounds for the book. And last time I saw it on offer in the UK, it was about 29 pounds. So don't be put off by those uh, one off adverts that you occasionally see on uh, Amazon or eBay for a copy for 80 quid, because that's not what it costs. Uh, alternatively, you may be able to find somebody in the US who can order it for you and uh, send it over as a gift. That might be a good way of getting hold of it.
Okay, so where are we? Uh, we're just heading towards the last part of the show. Um, don't forget, uh, if you can't ride your bike at the moment, you can at least read about riding. Head off to my uh, Spotlight page at my publishers, and you can have a look at my own books, um, which are still available for sale. Okay, so, all right, final part of the show then um, we've been talking about trying to keep biking fit over the last uh, few weeks um, for those of us who are off the bikes and locked down one of the things I've mentioned is that we do rapidly lose biking fitness now you may not think that riding a bike keeps you fit but it actually burns quite a few calories every day and you get a sort of an all body workout and again it's not an intense one it's fairly gentle but if you ride a lot of miles it's consistent and that's what builds fitness it's actually small repetitions not big efforts so riding a bike actually does tone your body up um, and one of the problems is if we have a break we lose that toning and i've talked about um, muscle strength in the wrist for example and how we lose the clutch strength if you're back on the bike after two months off you'll suddenly think what the hell happened to that clutch it was nice and light when i last rode the bike now it's stiff and heavy it's not the clutch it's your wrist strength that's gone so we need to do things like keep wrist strength up last week i gave you a nice little video to watch which had some very simple core strengthening exercises to be done in a chair today i'm going to talk about cardio um workout now again i will um put the disclaimer at this point i am not a doctor i'm not a physiotherapist i'm not an expert on this i'm an uh, sort of an enthusiastic amateur who believes that these sort of things are quite useful for motorcyclists so um do get some advice if you need it don't do anything that hurts and if you start to feel ill during any exercise stop immediately call the doctor if you have to so okay uh, for quite a while we've been told that we should spend a lot of time walking because walking is good cardio exercise um, we've been told that uh, 10,000 paces at a reasonable speed three miles an hour or so is a, a good way of getting our muscles moving and in particular it pushes our heart and lungs to work a bit harder now that's uh, a good for biking may also be good for COVID-19 um, because at least some of the reports are suggesting that uh, people with lung and heart dysfunction are uh, more at risk. Um, so yeah, walking actually ups the um, pressure on the heart to perform and we have to take deeper breaths. So the whole cardiovascular system, the um, lungs, the pulmonary system, they all improve and benefit from some cardio exercise um it becomes everything becomes more efficient lowers the resting heart rate lowers blood pressure so that's all good uh the nice thing about walking is we can do it pretty much anytime anywhere um and something that's important particularly for the uh, more mature riders amongst us is that it is generally seen to be fairly low impact on the body um that's good for people who don't, haven't done a lot of exercise uh, it's good for people with arthritis uh, it's good for people who are overweight um if there is a problem with this idea uh, of walking as cardio exercise it's that it takes time um 10,000 steps the former you know the recommended level um actually takes a while to walk it's at least 30 minutes and that's five days a week that we need to do that um for some people half an hour may not seem long but for some people um with a crowded lifestyle it can be difficult to find that time now if you lock down you've probably got it on your hands at the moment so maybe this is a good time to actually start building in some walking exercise um if you haven't done any start gently uh, don't go straight for the 10,000 start with maybe 2,000 steps a day and try adding a thousand steps a week so that would take you eight or nine weeks to reach that 10,000 mark um, it's a long-term plan but it's achievable that way um, three miles a day is 6,000 steps so that gives you an idea how far you actually have to walk for uh, 10,000 steps 
the day. Um, all that obviously depends on how tall you are and how fast you walk. Um, but you will be surprised at uh, how quickly the steps add up if you actually just make a little bit of a commitment. Now, okay, anything else that you need to think about? Well, um, shoes. Uh, your ordinary walking shoes probably aren't good enough for a lot of walking. Uh, I've made that mistake in the past. Um, had a pair of what I thought were decent trainers and i found within uh, within a few minutes of actually trying to do any long walking the my arches hurt so you do need uh, well cushioned lightweight flexible shoes um get some from a proper shoe shop if you can if you can't um then have a cast around for the best footwear you have and just don't overdo it to start with um what else do you need well um you don't strictly speaking need one but one of these is quite useful um there it is. It's my own fitness tracker. And you'll see it shows the time. Also shows I've taken a, a stunning 1,000 paces this morning before I sat down to the show. Um, that one cost me about 19 quid, I think. It's a Lenovo. Um, it's a lot, lot cheaper than the uh, something like a Fitbit. It doesn't have the bells and whistles. But do you need that if what you're counting is your paces and doing a basic check on your heart rate? That's all it needs. Um, you can up the, uh, the vigorousness of your exercise as you go. Um, speeding up is one option. Walking uphill is another one. If you've got a hill on the route, uh, do your steep hill. Um, and ultimately, that um, allows you to cut down on the exercise time. Um, you can mix it up as well. That's the other thing. Um, a lot of the recent advice seems to suggest that actually moving to a more vigorous cardio workouts is just as effective as these longer uh, less uh, strenuous walks um, the nhs live well website is worth looking at and one thing that you can go and have a look at is something called the 10 minute home cardio workout um, it's got a series of exercises which they say take you towards your active goal of 150 minutes um, now, if you're going to do anything a bit more vigorous, you do need to think about a warm up and a cool down routine. If you go straight into any vigorous exercise, you are asking your uh, to do some damage to your muscles. That's when muscle strains and pulls happen. So get warmed up first and cool down, get you into a cool down routine afterwards as well. Um, have a look at that page. It gives you a number of uh, exercises which will get you jumping around. Um, be careful. Um, for example, I wouldn't attempt the star jumps, I'm afraid, anymore. Um, I might have done them at school. I might have done them in my 20s when I was playing a lot of cricket. Um, but I certainly wouldn't do them now because they would just play havoc with my dodgy knees, courtesy of a couple of motorcycle crashes. Um, so if you are not happy with those kind of exercises, then get back and have a look at walking um next week i'll just have a quick look at cycling uh, as an option as well because that not only is cardio but it'll build up leg strength which is another one of those muscles which we'll be using out on the bike right okay um that is it for today amazingly we've whistled through another 30 odd minutes of uh 11s so don't forget um i have that very special guest chris horan on tomorrow i'll be playing a recorded interview with him which will carry us through uh yet another installment on ce clothing and it will help you understand why it is you need abrasion resistant clothing but also uh, give you a clue about how it actually functions as well as how it's tested so right for now thank you very much again for tuning in to 11s is uh, hopefully see you tomorrow and watch out for an announcement about a rerun of the science of being seen presentation which was such a hideous flop yesterday morning right okay thanks for watching bye for now